Okay. So welcome everyone to Value the Act of Reading online workshop. I am Laurie Freund, coordinator for the Southeastern Wisconsin, also known as SUI Region, which is a collaboration of six public library systems, Arrowhead, Bridges, Kenosha County, Lakeshores, Milwaukee County, and Monarch Library Systems. We get together to provide continuing education and other regional activities. Shana Kosicki is a VCE consultant from Southwest Library System and is also here to assist with this workshop. So thank you, Shauna, for being here. If you have any questions for the presenter or for us, please feel free to type those into the chat box. We are happy to have Anne Kissinger, who will be leading this workshop this morning. Anne is the Children's Library Supervisor at Wauwatosa Public Library, located in Milwaukee County. Her passion for children's literature has kept her in children's librarianship for over 17 years. Recently, her research led her to change the library's focus of having children read for rewards to reading as a reward and enjoyment. Anne can explain that and help us think about children's reading. So Anne, we'll let you begin. Oh, thank you, Laurie. Well, Laurie did such a fabulous job with my introduction. Um, I am with the Wauwatosa Public Library. My PhD was um, uh, in language and literacy. My dissertation is uh, focused on behavioral gender biases through anthropomorphism in picture books. Uh, and I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. But before we go into the slides, I tend to go down rabbit holes with research. I get very excited. So I just want you all to know when I say rabbit hole, that means there is a fathom of information that I would love to share, but we don't have the time to share on it. Um, and I also want to point out that this is research based and there is a lot of research that went into us transforming out of extrinsic rewards into intrinsic value. And it's really important that you read some of that research yourself because research does get diluted. Um, if any of you are familiar, I'm sure many of you are with um, windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. I just recently came across the seminal article on that, and it was actually from 1990 by Bishop, which was news to me. Here I am going down one of those rabbit holes, so I will digress uh, often, but I will pull myself back. Um, but it is, I just wanna stress that it is important for you to read some of this information. Um, the research is important on this, and it really is, a case for literacy here, um, and I will show you that. So this presentation is gonna throw a lot of information at you and it's really about you pulling those pieces together. And I will attempt to do that through this presentation. Um, I often think of our library um, as a business. We are in the business of literacy and I take that stance in this presentation. And I will also try to point out how we socialize children into literacy or not. Um, so, and before I move into the next slide, I just want you to jot down your initial thoughts or supports for rewards, because I know many of us give out rewards. So just jot down your initial thoughts or um, support for rewards, and we'll see how that changes by the end of this presentation. And if you want to share it in chat, that's fine. If not, we'll try to catch you at the end. So in 2017, um, the reading program finishers at Wauwatosa Public Library received up to 18 coupons to area attractions, restaurants and services. So we had 3000 reading logs in 2017 and every coupon had to be stamped with our Wauwatosa Public Library. And there was three different packets created. Now you all know how much time this in, is involved in pulling together all these coupons and stuff. Um, the businesses discovered the marketing potential, thereby they were providing goods or services to our library for the completion of summer reading, and we appreciate their support, but um, what happened is we became a coupon clearinghouse for businesses, and we began incurring the printing costs. Ninety-seven percent 
of the libraries are handing out coupons. And these coupons are called extrinsic rewards. Um, the librarians continue to try to find ways to expand these giveaways. And that is actually the wrong way we want to go. And I will show you why, because our research this is actually a form of oppression in reading. So in 2015, we got an email where the adult did not seek us for literacy support, but instead suggested that we got local businesses as sponsors so the kids could earn coupons and thinking this would be effective motivation factor for her daughter. Now, this is us socializing our patrons into thinking that coupons actually helpful are helpful to literacy, right? We are a library, we are in the business of literacy and we're giving coupons to have the children, what we think, have the children come in so they will become better readers. This is actually not the way it works. So, but we are actually socializing our communities into thinking that this is how we get children to read. So uh, during one of our summer reading programs, we had a father and daughter come in and they were standing right before me at our children's reference desk. They had a log from a, another library and they were there to collect coupons. And at the bottom of her log, she had the foot book, which is a very early reader. And she was probably in fifth grade. And when I said that this log was actually not one of the reading logs from Wauwatosa and that they had a different, they had different coupons and different um, requirements for the coupons, um, the, the daughter looked at her father and said, see, I told you, you should have just let me, you know, read one of my own books. And instead you had me read this stupid foot book. So they were these reading logs actually push children, and there's a lot of research on this, they're not reading for their own enjoyment. They're not reading at their own levels. They're not reading what they should and could be reading, what they want to read, their interest, which is extremely important to their reading. They're reading to fill in our logs or our requirements. We also had a patron, and this was their sixth library visit, um, and they had hoped to get to 11 libraries that summer just to go around and collect coupons. So this was a father and son who um, are in the area during the summer. I had known them. I had turned this child on to a series of books when his father first brought him into the library. He wrote to the author. He was very excited about reading. Um, years had gone by and now they're still going around collecting coupons. And the problem with that is that this child looked at me when his father was talking about how he was now earning coupons for his cousins. So when they come to visit, they can um, do these things that he wouldn't be able to do because he wouldn't be in the area anymore. Uh, this is not literacy. This is not good for this child's um, value of literacy. So public libraries and research, um, there's not a lot of research in our libraries on how effective our reading programs are. And so what we need to do is we need to look at research elsewhere and make it uh, apply to us. So we do know that reading skill follows a lifelong trajectory. The preparation begins in infancy. So people come to the libraries before formal education even begins. That is on us. Um, so before they're entering K3, K4, K5, they're coming to the library. And it's really important for us to get that, you know, to get that literacy started correctly. So the research on extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. So extrinsic motivation is the coupons. And when we hand out coupons or we have a child read in order to get something, we are actually devaluing reading itself. And it negatively predicts comprehension unless it is associated with intrinsic motivation. So intrinsic motivation is where the child or the person, you yourself, are reading for your own motivation. You're reading for your own value to either fulfill, you know, um, your your own questions, your own learning, or just for amusement. 
Um, extrinsic motivation, it partially neutralizes the beneficial effects of intrinsic motivation. So a child that already is reading for intrinsic motivation, think of those prolific um, readers that come into your library. When we hand them a coupon for reading, we are devaluing their intrinsic motivation. Avid readers read less when presented with extrinsic rewards. So here's a quick little rabbit hole. Um, this research has happened not just with reading, but even with coloring. So when children are given rewards for coloring, coloring sheets, uh, they are less likely to enjoy coloring. Um, so rewards should not be emphasized, especially with reluctant readers. This is really harmful for them. And the long-term impact, it's less likely to engage in the absence of a reward. So again, that's like this coloring research. When we give them rewards, they're less likely to engage. Um, so intrinsic motivation, uh, children are more motivated to engage in subsequent reading than students who received a token reward. There's a lot of research on that. Uh, engage in voluntary summer reading and thereby have significantly higher reading achievement. And intrinsic motivation, successful effective reading program will engage readers in obtaining their own intrinsic motivation. So that I have bolded because that is pretty much our research that we need to follow or focus on. So this, I have our bibliography right here. This is all the research on extrinsic, intrinsic motivation. So there is a lot. And here is some more current information right here. Uh, I just try to keep up with the research to see if and ever anything comes out that coupons are a good thing and they are not still to this day. So this is a quote by Helen Keller. I had forgotten that I owed my success partly to the advantages of my birth and environment. Now, however, I learned that the power to rise in the world is not within the reach of everyone. So here, if you look at these graphics, the black and the red is not very good. Um, you want to focus on the yellow and the green, which you don't see so much out there. And the Wisconsin African American students rank last among black students in the country and significantly below their national average. Wisconsin, so this is us, has a gap of 39.09 points between white and black students, the largest gap of any state. This gap represents almost four grade levels when they are only in fourth grade. That is significant. So when we, what this is saying is at fourth grade, there's a four, there's, there's a four grade gap there. Wisconsin's most advantaged white students, so these are not the low social economic status um, and no disabilities, rank 40th. Hispanic students had an average score that was 19 points lower than that for white students. This performance gap was not significantly, significantly different from that in 1998. Students who were eligible for the National School Lunch Program had an average score that was 29 points lower than that for students who were not eligible. This performance gap was not significantly different from that in 1998. So you'll see our reading scores are not, they're one, they're, they're either stagnating or they're not moving in the correct direction. They're actually getting lower. Overall student progress in reading has stalled in the last decade with the highest performers stagnating and the lowest achieving students falling further behind. So what's significant about this slide is, if you look at the research, we don't have a lot of research on the effectiveness of our reading programs. And remember that reading begins in infancy, before formal education, before, they even, before our students even get to our educators that have maybe you know, the reading specialists available to, for them to help read. So we need to get them on the right track. So another quote from Helen Keller, uh, people do not like to think. If one thinks one must reach conclusions and conclusions are not always pleasant. This transformation requires us to move in a different direction. It's gonna require backlash. It's gonna require more work on our part. There is, there is a silver lining in all of this though in many different ways. Um, 
at the beginning of that first slide, I had a little picture of a, um, a tail of a wolf with a rabbit going up that wolf's tail. And that is from Emily, Emily Gravitt's book called Wolves. What's significant about that is that that wolf is reading really involved in a book, so involved in that, in that book that the rabbit is not paying attention to what's going on around it. And I feel that what that is something that we did at Wauwatosa. We always did coupons. We prided ourselves when we hit that 3000 mark. We, we were like having this yay moment, but it was when we had these people lining up to collect coupons and we couldn't take care of our patrons that were there to have a book recommendation or come out and on the floor to talk about books with them. We didn't have the time. We were, we were pretty much saying, we'll be with you in just one minute or if you wanna to go to the catalog and we'll be right with you because we were too busy handing out coupons. We were a coupon clearing house. Is that the business we wanna be or do we wanna be in the business of literacy? And this is in, this is at 2017 where started to think and started to come to conclusions about and really question what, what are we, what are we doing? The extrinsic rewards place children's literacy development at the expense of our statistical gains. We were driven by statistics. We were driven by this idea that we had to hand in a number at the end of summer and there is just something inherently wrong with this. So we are gonna have a breakout now and we have some questions here. Lori is gonna send you out to the breakout rooms um, and you can see the questions there on the side. And so we would ask that you look at those questions in your breakout rooms, um, share what your initial thoughts on rewards were, uh, if you'd like to, if you're comfortable with that. Um, and then Lori, I'll let you take it from here. Okay, thanks. Just give me a minute and sure. we will do that in the breakout room and make sure you, in the meantime, take a look at the questions. And how much time do we want to give them, Lori? We are going to give them about 15 minutes. So okay. hang on. Okay. Okay. So our involvement in the emphasis on extrinsic rewards in exchange for reading, thereby socializing our community's culture, beliefs, and attitudes and what motivates children to read needed to stop. So every child deserves the right to grow up in a society that reads for, for intrinsic value. Just gonna minimize my thing here. So here we have a couple of children there just um, and this was after a story time and they came out, you know, we're, we're, we are the role models, right, for literacy. And this is our, after our first summer moving to intrinsic rewards. We had goal setting and this young gentleman here wanted to just focus on cooking books that summer. And he brought in a loaf of bread and a whole stick of butter for us to share. So that first year too, when we moved to uh, just intrinsic motivation, we had to inform our patrons and educate our patrons. And we came up with our literacy stance. And this is on a lot of our, it's on our website and it's also on our, some of our marketing materials. We are always reading and we are always learning. Literacy is social and requires practice. As literacy advocates, we support and value reading engagement all year long. So we welcome your child's conversations regarding their reading. So as literacy advocates, we support and value reading engagement all year long. So Wauwatosa, we no longer have a summer reading program. We read and we program all year long. So we do not have a summer calendar. We don't have summer special, what we call summer programs. We have a rolling calendar that we update every month and it goes out two months and everything is online. And this is pretty much what we've been telling our patrons that we don't have a start and a stop to reading that we are always reading and we are always here for them. 
So how do we maximize the value of reading? We value the activity of reading. So over here, this is one of my colleagues with a young patron. I cannot tell you how much, I, this is where I wish I had research or that somebody was actually doing some type of time study for us. We are on the floor and book talking and selling books like you wouldn't believe. I mean, I cannot tell you how we are always up from behind our reference desk on the floor talking about books. So this has been a significant for us. Uh, we have patrons that just send pictures of um, their children reading anywhere. So their goals might've been to try to read in different spots. So she's reading at the pool. And this is one of my favorite pictures down here at the bottom. So this young patron, uh, the family was having movie night outside. She did not have proper lighting, so she took her book and used the lighting from the movie to refinish reading her book. So intrinsic motivation, this is what you can and already do. So we already are focusing on intrinsic motivation, all of us are. We just need to take that, those coupons and that extrinsic motivation out of the libraries, right? So motivation and engagement for intrinsic motivation is supported through, and this is research, it's supported through goals, choices, hands-on activities, and collaboration for learning. We already are doing this, you guys, right? So we have, we all have in our libraries, hands-on activities. We have collaboration for learning anytime we have programs. Um, the goals and choices, I'm not sure if you all are, but there, there are ways that you can improve this or start to do this. So we wanna support, empower, and trust our readers. So in 2018, this is after, right after, this is our first year of moving out of the extrinsic rewards. Um, this is a quote from Freire who wrote Pedagogy of the Oppressed that we are transformative beings and not beings for accommodation. So as I said earlier, we will not accommodate statistics anymore, right? Uh, we are not as concerned about who needs our stats as what we are doing for literacy. So up here in this upper left-hand corner, this is somebody who is a business owner in Wauwatosa. So this is a different way of us supporting our businesses. She um, is a pediatric dentist and she came in and did a program on brushing your teeth and healthy mouths. Over here, we have another business owner and she did a program on superheroes and just taking care of your um, having a healthy body. So we're engaging our, our businesses differently, our local businesses. So we're not cutting them off, we're just engaging them differently. This one is, uh, we had our um, Milwaukee Art Museum. They had a class with teens and the teens actually came to our library and taught the children in a program what they learned at the Milwaukee Art Museum. Uh, we hand out a lot of coupons. We used to hand out coupons like the zoo, the state fair, the Milwaukee Art Museum. Um, so what was concern, concerning is access, right? How, how do we continue making sure that these children have access? Well, we brought the programs to us. We brought them to us or we, um, in 2019, we purchased zoo passes and the domes. So we actually purchased them. They're available all year now. So people can come and check those out and then they can use them at their own convenience. Uh, this is, again, just the collaboration for learning that's going on in our programs, which is increasing our intrinsic value, right? It's fun. So we know that we are all accountable to our boards. Um, so in 2018, we had more programming because we had more time. Um, and we have to do reports. So here's 2017, our programs. And this, is, of course, is pre-pandemic. 2019, you can see how our programs grew. And our summer participation. So look at, you know, the summer participation went down in 2018. Here it starts to increase. But I need to remind you that this up here this is a lot of those false statistics, right? Where we have people just simply coming in for the coupons and hopping from one library to another library. They really, we weren't engaging them in literacy or programs, 
They came to us for something else. So this is some of, this may answer some of your questions. We support how we support literacy. Uh, up here, we have our 1001 books before kindergarten. This requires the reader to enter the library, right? So we, we do not do any virtual apps here. You need to come in, you need to hand this in. We get to talk to the child about what books they've read. Down here, we have our books first bags. So this, our books first bags actually consist of um, five books in the bag with a sheet that explains what it is. So to support 1001, we have like Cinderella around the world, the circular tales, the cumulative tales, fractured three little pigs and postmodern books. These are kind of giving the child that basic structure of a story that is really important. So what we saw is that when children would come in and look for books, they would go for the, which is fine, that's their interest level, right? They're going for the Paw Patrol, the Daniel Tiger, um, the superheroes, but they're missing out sometimes on just those basic story structures. And so we put together books first and up here in 1001, we have recommended a titles. It's not 1001 recommended titles because we know that that child's interest really has to play into their reading as well. But we make sure that those child, that that child is exposed to those um, classics and those basic story structures. Uh, and then we've expanded it. This is a more current one. We did an ana analytical reading or critical literacy for fourth and sixth graders in a book's first bag. So this is where we are having the children look at the picture books and looking at it and reading it against the grain. So, so often our children, our families think you read the book, you know, the author and illustrator, they know what they're doing. Well, there's this unconscious bias sometimes that goes on in books, sometimes even conscious, right? We don't know, right? So we're having the children learn to read against the grain. And I gave them an example of Babar in there. And then we have other books that we recommend. And some of them, yeah, are really good, well done books. And some of them you're going to have to read against the grain and see the bias. This is how we can empower our readers. Um, background knowledge is extremely important to children's literacy. So I showed them how important that is. I gave two groups, I had a classroom come in. I gave both of each classroom a stack of words. I told one classroom what then what would they what they would do is they would walk up to the wall pick a word and they would have to draw it so it might just be hat they'd have to draw the hat or they'd have to draw the dress or the hands or the ears but i told the one class some background knowledge about what this stack of vocabulary words was and the other class i did not this is how that background knowledge affects their comprehension of what they're what what they are creating their meaning that they're creating and so giving children analogies is really important too because we're not we're, we we all can't learn the same way right analogies is extremely important in learning um, we hang different things around the library. So this is the Missy Lincoln reading comprehension. We have this little poster hanging or ready to go by our early readers. We debunk myths. So there's research out there that will um, show that what you'll hear sometimes in your library is a um, parent telling the child, no, you have to read the book first before you read the movie. Actually, some children, many children, many adults, if they watch the movie first, they're gonna do a closer reading of the book and comprehend it better because they know what might be different and they're gonna be looking for little things that, um, you know, almost like a, a sleuth, right? So they're gonna be looking differently at that book and reading it differently. Uh, here we had, um, we just got the Ozobots that are available for checkout. We just got them in, they were sitting in the boxes. We didn't even have them ready to go. Uh, two girls came up and said, oh, what are those? And I'm like, they're Ozobots, oh, I love those. And so I had her show me how they work, right? I had never held an Ozobot in my hands. And then two more girls came up to learn and also engage 
me in my learning of the Ozobot. So I empowered them to teach me to, re to understand this. And then we have literacy goal ideas. So goal setting is really important in children's interest in literacy. And so we start them, we give them ideas, but that doesn't mean they have to follow these for any certain reason. So we are gonna trust them. We are gonna trust them in their goals. We have these out all year long. It's just a goal card where they set their own goals and we ask, how, how did you achieve your goal? Um, they don't have to bring this back to us. They can, like I said, in our stance, they can bring this back to us and talk to us about their goal. This is socializing, right? This is socializing our children into reading. Come and talk to us about your books. Uh, we trust the readers too. We have passports for reading. They can pick up a passport and then they go through the library, all the different areas of the library, and they write down the title, the author, the number of the pages, and whether or not they would recommend the book, yes or no, why. Um, and then they can check in with us. So again, this checking in with us is really, they're not getting a prize here. Um, this sticker can is and is seen as a form of a extrinsic reward. Um, these, this is where we struggle but this also has them come back to us to socialize. So we're, we're, we're still working on this, right? And we're also expanding this um, area where they can explain more to us because we really want to engage the child in telling us why they would recommend or not recommend the book. Uh, here we had moved, we used to have a rule of um, only one child at a computer and after attending someone else's conference, about you know, the collaboration of learning and how important that is. We did not set that anymore as one of our rules or our policies. And this is actually children working on a game, four different children, four different chairs pulled up to our, one of our computers and they were all working on a game and just crushing that game together. Um, here is, this is a rabbit hole here. So I just wanna point out, this is a girl using an AR reading list here. And if you notice in her stack, she's already got this book picked out and she is looking at it again. She pulled it off the shelf again, not realizing she already pulled it off the shelf. Um, this is a rabbit hole here. Accelerated reading, Fontas and Pinnell, those reading levels. Uh, again, we could do another whole couple presentations on that too. Um, so getting back to this though, our 1001 books too, when they finish 1001, uh, we, we don't give them any, at 550, we do give them little um, finger puppets um, so they can tell their own stories, but we're gonna move away with that, move away from that when our finger puppets are gone. Uh, at the end of 1001 books before kindergarten, they do get a book placed in their honor in the library. So they get to pick their book and then we put a plate in it in their honor. They're the first to check it out. So again, that's still technically a prize. They're not walking home with it. It's a shared resource and that's what our libraries are all about. And so we, we talk about that with them as well. So I wanna get into goal setting. Um, it's really important for children's literacy. Um, they invest in their own literacy when they goal set. And so when we have parents coming into the library, especially without the child, and they're picking a book for their child to take home because their child's not a reader, uh, we try to send them home with a stack of books because that way, and we'll let the parent know that that child needs a choice in their reading. And when they pick out of their stack what book they're going to read, they're more likely to read a book that they chose out of that stack versus the parent coming home with a book and just saying, read this book. So this is an example of goal setting during our, um, like I said, we have these goal sheets out all the time. During the summer, we had a child come in and he said he wanted to increase his reading level. He wanted to read different types of books and he wanted to create comics, co comic books and read them. So. Here we are fostering intrinsic motivation. Um, children that set their own literacy goals are more motivated to engage in their literacy challenges. They're more likely to focus on meaning and build knowledge and understand deeply rather than on rewards. So it's a choice and autonomy support there. And he actually met his goals by reading a higher level. He read Aladdin, which is a fifth grader book. 
He, um, I like to read different types of books that I enjoy. I read books by David Pilkey, The Hundred Dresses, I Survived in Stone Facts, and I drew and wrote a comic book about a superhero. So the, this right here, the writing, the comprehension and writing go hand in hand. Readers and writers begin from different places. Writing is so important to, to literacy as well. Um, we need to find more ways to get that writing in on it. And that is part of our passport program is to expand that. Why, you know, why did you like this book or not like this book? Get them writing about it. Um, this hundred dresses here. So he, his mother came back to us and said he never would have picked out this book, but we had it in a super secret book club. And that's where we just wrap up books, give the theme of the book on the front and they just walk away and unwrap the book at home and then read the book. So that is a extremely popular program, so popular that we're only able to offer it every quarter. We try to because we can't keep up with wrapping all the books. So this is our circulation. So in 2017, this is how our coupons affected circulation, right? So 2017, our circulation was up. In 2018, we weren't far, far behind. And then in 2019, we started to see it go up. 2021, again, this is during our COVID years here. Uh, we just got our March numbers. I haven't seen just the um, March of 2022, but I was told in one of our department heads meeting that our March numbers are coming at pre-pandemic. So feedback, this is reality, moving away from extrinsic rewards to those people that are so used to coming in for coupons. Uh, I'm gonna let you read these bullet points on your own, but what it is, is you've got kind of three different um, types of feedback here. You have people that already know about the research on extrinsic rewards. You're gonna have those educators and um, reading specialists that already are familiar with that. You're gonna have people that are listening to you, listening to uh, you know us talking about it, out there educating them on, the research and then you're just going to have people that um, don't believe any of that right they are they're not ready to listen to that research and there was a question um, the person is um, wondering if the reporting writing doesn't feel like homework and if and is holding some children back from participating yeah so like those passports um, we're not, you do not, if you come back to us with no, nothing written in there, um, we'll ask, we'll try to engage that, that is socializing reading. So the socialization of reading is extremely important to literacy. So what that means is um, we know that children that have books in their homes uh, are coming from a stance of, we have books, we probably talk about books, the parents that bring the children to the library. Um, we, you know, if we see the parent without books, sometimes we'll say, you know, what are you reading, right? Because I'm an adult and I will take recommendations from the parents. I will take recommendations from the kids and I will read that book. And next time I see them in the library, I will say, hey, thank you for that recommendation. I read it. This is what I liked about this is what I didn't like about it. This is the socialization of reading. It's talking about reading. So I had a personal, um, I have four children, three children, voracious readers. My fourth child wanted nothing to do with books at all. I would leave them lay open all over the house. I would just read out loud and the other kids would come up and listen to a picture book, even though they were already beyond picture books. Well, we were never beyond picture books, but reading you know, at a fifth, sixth grade level by that time. Um, wasn't until fourth grade when a teacher was reading a book out loud to the classroom, right? This collaborative reading. And he came home and said, could you please get that book from the library? I need to, I need to know how that ends ahead of, I mean, he was just really involved in that. It was, that teacher was socializing the class as a whole into reading. Um, so we need all, we need these discussions about reading and so, when a child comes in really excited about a book, right? We know they're reading, we know they're a library user. And so when they're excited about a book, just that simple question of, wow, you know, 
who are you going to share that with? Who are you going to tell, you know, who, what friends can you tell, you know, about this book? Because chances are they might know a friend that isn't a reader and they're going to start talking books, right? So we had at our, um, our middle school, our middle school here in Wauwatosa had a reader writer workshop. And interestingly, it was for kids that were already heavily involved and loved reading, loved writing. So they were then recommended to go into this class by, by the educators. Well, unfortunately, the children that really needed that class that needed to be socialized into reading and writing weren't getting into that class. They were going into a computer class. And so because I had the knowledge, the background knowledge for this class, I said, I would like my child, you had the, my other three children in this class, I know about this class, I need my child to be in this class because yes, he's not exposed to reading and writing socially, he has no interest in it, so he needs to be with kids. Well, today that my fourth child um, is self-educated, he is going down all these different rabbit holes, holes and is really hard to pull away from something that he is just reading, 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 right? So any opportunity we have to not only socialize adults and children into reading, we need to, but then we, we also need to talk to them about them then going on and socializing other people into reading. Does that answer the question? I believe it might, but there is another question that has mm -hmm. come up. How can we move away from state reporting? I feel like libraries are very invested in SLP statistics. So I would say that Wauwatosa did, right? So who are those statistics for? And I'm gonna, you know, this is a discussion or this is something where maybe we all report to DPI. Um, why, why, right? What is DPI using those statistics for? And are, are those statistics even good statistics? When Wauwatosa would report to DPI, especially that big in 2017, when we had that 3000, we felt like we were hitting new high levels. Um, what does that mean? What does that mean for literacy? You know, when, when DPI is using our statistics that really aren't good statistics um, and they, I'm really not exactly sure how they are using them, right? But if they say this many children were involved in literacy, what does that mean, involved in literacy? Because they came into a library for a coupon or like, what are we, our, our reading levels are down. I, I just, I think we need to scrap everything that we've been doing and, and just, just give ourselves a clean new slate and focus on literacy. What are we doing for literacy? How, how can we measure literacy differently? It's not by how many coupons we give out. It has nothing to do with literacy. Another person piped out and said the annual report this year did not ask for any specific summer reading program statistics. And that um, the person included, um, said that I included mine in the self-directed activities. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what, I know DPI is, is going back to, um, or the state is going back to us reporting the programming for different, the different age levels and stuff. Um, I think it is important for us to have the programs because it brings children together. It brings different, you know, perspectives in our programs. Um, and the children, you know, when you bring children together, uh, when you're doing a book talk out on the floor, it's often fascinating when you are talking about a book and all of a sudden a child comes running up and says, oh, I read that book too, you know, this is so good. Step back because that peer to peer, that age group to that age group selling a book is better than you selling that book or a parent selling a book. So sometimes you just need to step back and let, let them talk or even the parents, when you're out there book talking, another parent would be, oh yeah, you know, another, you know, somebody who wasn't even involved in that conversation We'll say, oh yeah, you know, another good series is blah, blah, blah. And they'll get involved in that. And that's parent to parent talking about it. You know, step back and let them socialize each other into, into the literacy. 
No other questions. No others? No others. Okay. So here, here is just a um, one little transformation here. If you remember early on in the slides in 2015, we had a mother who emailed us looking for more coupons um, for her child's because she wanted to increase her child's literacy. And that is where we were with our socializing people into what literacy was. That is what we told, that is what, this is the idea we gave to them, right? That coupons are good for literacy or this is how we're bringing you into our business and our business is literacy. Um, and then in 2019, our kids love to go to the library. We visit nearly every week for an event, story time, finding new books or just to meet up with friends and do puzzles. That is socialization right there. Um, the staff is fantastic and helps us find what we need. They truly love books and helping build readers in our community. So I think that last part of that sentence there really kind of demonstrates us talking to parents a lot about um, just reading and our background knowledge and sharing that background knowledge with them. It's, I think it's, it's, it's okay for us to sometimes just debunk some of these myths verbally with, with our families out there. Even like graphic novels. How many times do you hear, uh, yeah, you, you know, um, my husband doesn't want my child, here's, a, here's a, another example, my child doesn't want um, him to read any more graphic novels. And you just say, well, actually there's a lot of good research out there on visual literacy and that's his interest level, blah, blah, blah. She went home and told her husband, Husband says, I want to see the research and I forwarded the research. So let's just go out there and, and, and give, give them truth. So this is, these are just sign, come some ending questions here is, um, how can public libraries socialize children into reading? This is, where, this is where Wauwatosa is at right now, right? We've gotten rid of all extrinsic rewards with the exception of that book at the end of 1001, which goes actually back into the collection and is not going home. Um, and our passports, that little sticker still could be seen as an extrinsic reward. And um, what does a successful public library reading program look like? I guess, um, how do we define a reading program? And do, maybe we need a new name for it. Maybe scrap that idea of a reading program and come up with something that is more holistic to who we are and what we are as a library all year long, like forever, right? And then I just have at the end of my slides here, because this is recorded, I have decodable texts for all ages, teens and adults, um, and also just some extended resources here. Um, I, and I just want to say again that Badger Link is is really a resource for us. You can go there for and start your research or any questions you have for anything. Don't be afraid to go there. Um, you might feel like some of that research is, it gets, again, the research itself goes down into rabbit holes, uh, but you will follow those rabbit holes and that is your interest and that's where it will take you. So do we have any more um, questions or comments? That is, we have 18 minutes left. Okay, uh, just some we can end little early. comments. Um, I'm curious about coupons you've had because ours certainly aren't exciting enough to be the parent motivator. Um, one of our struggles is getting the non-library community to come in. And oh, I want to, I also, there's one out there, is there a difference between um, right. reading rewards for younger children and using them for teens and adults? Uh, interestingly, um, so we have a young adult librarian now at our library, which we didn't have in the past. Um, and our adults is trying to step up reading with adults. Um, and they, they know that we just moved away from rewards and they were looking at other libraries programs and how 
there's drawings for adults and this for adults. And so I asked, they came to me and said, you know, we don't want to use rewards. You know, how do you feel about this? And they just had, um, they had adults that were reading um, come back with, um, you know, your favorite book and tell us why it's your favorite book. And they just put together like, like a little, a little booklet of reading suggestions, right? Again, it's that socialization of, of reading as a community. And it's often fun to, um, in one of my pictures, I don't know if you caught it, there was an open book of how do seeds travel. And inside that book was a pod. Um, I think that was ingenious. This was that person, that patron who checked out that book, really taking that book to a different level and their understanding. But how often is it where you just come across a children's book and there's writing in that book? I mean, how can you not love that, right? I mean, the book is now considered damaged, right? But that is that child understanding that there's writing in this book and they want to they want to add to it, right? So yeah, another rabbit hole. Sorry, you guys. I see some ideas coming in there too, instead of um, rather than a reading program, just, just, you know, call it learning library. Right. Cause even, even our, um, our programs, you know, they, they, they are our, our, our programs where the, you know, people are coming in to experience art or something else. We're not necessarily having them reading, but we're, we are there. And that is part of literacy too, is offering them the background knowledge. Struggles getting the non-library community to come in. So, um, you know, that having the non-library community come in, that again is part of socialization. So I think one of the cool things we found out during COVID is, we couldn't have people come into the library for a while. So we did what we called book picnics and we went out to them. I seriously just shoved the back of my little, little tiny Subaru with crates of books and I went to homes and we had a host in our neighborhoods host a library picnic. Um, and what it was is everyone would just come to their yard and pick out books and we would just did manual checkouts. What was cool about that is it was in a neighborhood so they just told their neighborhood about it. And we got non-library users to come in um, to the library after that, because they're like, wow, you know, books for free. This is cool. And I haven't been to a library since I was a kid. Um, another way of getting non-library users in is um, when the class visits come to our library, we are fortunate to have a lot of classes come to our library. Uh, they have, um, parents volunteer to come chaperone and I had a father who came with a class um, and he came back that evening with his child they both got their library cards that evening after the program and he came up to me and he said I, I never knew he goes I pass by this library every day on my way to and from work and he goes I never knew I had never ever been in a library I mean that was an eye-opener for me too um, we also have our schools do a art, pro, you know, their art, they display their art in our library, and then they invite the families to come. We have two open houses. The families come to the library um, art shows, and those often are families that have never been in our library. And, and it's really interesting to hear them talk about the collection because it's things they've never seen before. There are a few other questions um, too. For middle schoolers, middle schoolers, our rewards are tied to visiting the library. I figured if they come in often enough, they might at some point read a book, right? Hmm. Yeah, so I think we, you need, to, you need to think of yourself, your library, give yourself more credit. Give yourself more credit than that coupon, right? Um, we are literacy. 
uh, it maybe it might uh, involve you going to the middle school and doing book talks with the with the children. Um, I did a program with Hales Corners where I actually went uh, when I was there. I actually went to the schools and they were small enough um, schools where uh, we could go in during the lunch hour and talk about books while the children were eating, which was interesting, right? So bring it to them sometimes is better than offering a reward and having them come to you for that reward. I think libraries need to give themselves more credit, right? Don't, don't devalue yourself to a reward. Bring, bring them in for something else. You know, you know, meet you come up with programs of interest and, and then just market the hell out of it at that school. And again, that's, you know, the children need to socialize around that. Um, there is, there is an, there's interesting research, and this was out of Madison too, about, um, you know, children's choices and books. When they gave children choices in the classrooms, um, they would give, you know, they had like 20 different titles and the child could pick whatever book they wanted to read, but they had to pick one of those books to read. And different children from different groups um, chose different books and then they had to come together and talk about it. And so that socialization, you know, meeting children from outside of their, their friend group or whatever was really interesting too. So, you know, go, go into these middle schools and, and present different types of programs that you're gonna have at your library. And it might bring different groups, different children from different social groups into the library. And they might, you know, they, they, they socialize differently and they respect differently. Was there another one, Laurie? Yeah, have you worked with the schools as you've transitioned? Uh, so we're very much in line with our schools. Um, matter of fact, I'm meeting with our superintendent because we're also transforming our way, the way we do our educator cards. Um, we're actually gonna take control of that. And that again, another whole rabbit hole. Um, but we, we let them know that we were moving away from the coupons. And so a lot of, a lot of teachers at the end of the school year in May and June, uh, we pretty much cut in-house programming and we just went to schools to promote summer reading or had the schools come to us to promote summer reading. So they know that we've moved to all year and they always come to us anyhow um, for class visits. We'll um, do class visits during the whole school year. Um, so, but what we've done is instead of us promoting it now saying, yeah, and if you come to the library, you get this and you get this and you get this, right? We're using vocabulary different with the children, right? So we're, if they're coming in May and June and the teacher still thinks or is trying to push and we do, we wanna push that, you know what, you're not in school, but you know what, the library has all these great books, right? We're not gonna tell them to come for a coupon, right? We're, we're, we're having you come because we've got these great programs going on that we hope will interest you. And we've got all these different books and we do book talks, right? So we're, we're in the business of literacy and that's what we're selling. Another person wrote this year, we're going to let high school students decide if they want to do the middle school program where they get to spin a wheel and pick up a, a little prize each week when they visit the library or participate or participating in the adult program where they do a traditional raffle tickets drawing prizes program. Hmm. Again, I would, um, the research is out there on the raffles. I Libraries should not be, nobody involved in literacy should be doing raffles for literacy you know i the whole intrinsic we want people reading lifelong readers we want them coming back to the library to read we want them to be heavily involved in reading our reading reading is down i mean go back to that research you guys <laughs> wisconsin is bombing out and we need to think differently about reading and it starts in infancy it starts with phonics early on uh, I recommend reading Seidenberg's book out of Madison, uh, or really you could go to Badgerlink and read about early literacy and phonics. Uh, we, we really need to just wipe our slate clean, 
and come back in and do things differently when it comes to reading. It's not just about bringing people into the library to read, it's about how we present reading to the families. Anything else? Uh, see, one person wrote, we are so dependent on parents to bring the children to the, into the library. Yeah, and you know, I'm sure you have programs that socialize those parents at the library too, right? So like we know our rhyme time is extremely social. Uh, these parents meet other parents there. They hang out before and after the program. So programs, programs bring the children in. And, and again, if, if they hear other parents are going to the library, are going to the library for books, if they are talking about it on the playground or when they go to the parks during the summer, they're, they're talking about the program they were just at or a program they missed. Um, they, we need the parents that come into the library to talk about the library with parents that are not coming into the library. And we have verbalized that to parents before. And children with their books. Who are you gonna, who are you gonna tell about this book, right? Who can you talk to about this book? They're gonna go talk to their friends. I mean, how often do you hear when a child comes into the library, oh, my, you know, my friends are reading this or when you have a reluctant reader or you know, the parent come in and you can pull a book and pretty much say, you know, I bet you they've seen this book at their library, a lot of children reading this book. Again, that's, that's socializing. There's a comment, um, Drive um, by Daniel Pink is a good resource for thinking about extrinsic versus intrinsic rewards. Oh, I um, that down. I'm not familiar with that one. You know, too, um, uh, now I can't think of the title, but somebody just did a, um, a book too, which is really interesting that, um, has the children do a close reading like you're you're at I think the fourth chapter or something it says ah but I use the word I use the word they thought he was a good prince I didn't say he was a good prince and you know has the reader actually go back and do a closer reading so I think our um a lot of our authors are just ingenious on how they are kind of infiltrating reading and having children do closer readings and they they know they have that knowledge there's a question, should we not do crafts for story time? Uh, I, I don't think, I don't think uh, crafts is a reward unless you are touting it as a reward, right? So crafts are a learning opportunity and that kind of brings the children in and extend their, extend their learning and the children can talk during crafts. I mean, that, that's a learning opportunity. Um, I don't see the craft as, as a prize unless you are using it or insinuating that it's a prize. Um, another one wrote, uh, so difficult when you have parents who do not read or support reading. We've discussed how to reach families where they go, um, laundromats, bars, et cetera. Yeah. That's, I, I mean, every library is there with you on that. Um, it, it is, it, it does come down to outreach. And I know we don't, you know, one of our strategic plans at our library is to do more outreach programs and meet families where they're at. So we are actually going to our evening festivals with a library tent um, to reach those families that are going to listen to a concert and may not be aware of the library. Um, so it is, it, it's about going and meeting people where they are. And that's it right now. All right, well, thank you everyone. Uh, my email is at the first slide. I, I embrace and love questions or even um, concerns and challenges because challenges help my thinking. Um, so please email me and reach out for anything or any further ideas because 
as Wisconsin Libraries, we are all in this together. I, I would love to share anything and everything. And I hope you do with me as well, because we are only stronger when we come together and really share our knowledge and ideas with each other. So thank you all for attending. Thank you, Anne, for leading this online workshop. Um, we will share it in slides um, and also a CE activity report for those who need that. So please watch for those. Um, uh, in your email um, that'll be coming. Um, so thank you for attending this workshop and may you enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>